Well, good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be able to come here and just to share God's word with you. And um, I pray that this passage of scripture will be a blessing to you like it has been with to me this week as I've been studying it and going over it. Um, a passage of scripture we may be familiar with, should be familiar with, but one I think it bears visiting. And you'll see why in a minute why the Lord laid it on my heart. But let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Father God, again, we thank you for your word. I pray, Father, now as we focus on your word that we'll try to put everything else that's been happening this week out of our minds and focus on you, focus on your word, and allow your Holy Spirit to teach us and guide us in the way you would have us to go. Father, I pray that if there's anything that in our hearts that needs to be convicted of, you would do that. And Lord, I pray also if there's anyone here today that does not know Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day they would trust in him. So, Father, thank you again for all you do for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I may have told some of you in the past, my father, who's home with the Lord now, uh, was a ranger in World War II. And as he was looking at people being drafted and being sent into battle when the war began, he realized that he wanted to make sure he had the best training possible before he went into battle. So he said, I'm going to join the Rangers. Some people thought he was crazy because the Rangers was a force that would go in and attack an area to take it. And then they would allow the infantry or whatever to come and hold it. But he said, no, I want the best training possible so that when I go to battle, I'm ready. And so the title of the message this morning is ready for battle. And you know, my father, by God's grace and through his training, he was able to return home, obviously, because I'm here. And, uh, <laughs> And it, he, he would tell me many times that it was God's grace and his training that got him through it. And that's the same thing with us. As we go today to um, Ephesians chapter 6, and I invite you to get your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 10 to 20. Before I do that, as most of you know, Terry and I were recently in the States for our son Luke's wedding and his now wife Nadia's wedding. I always say my son's Luke's wedding like he's the only one there. But, but in his beautiful wife, Nadia. And, you know, the day before the wedding, Luke and Nadia wanted us to see Greenville, South Carolina. And that's where the, the wedding was being held. And especially they wanted us to take us through town. And there's a historic suspension bridge there that everyone goes to see. And so we were walking through town a few blocks to go see this suspension bridge. And as we walked towards the bridge, the spiritual battle that's being waged in the world today became very evident. The first block, as we were walking through, we saw a group of people, a large group of people, protesting the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, which is, uh, protects federally the woman's right to murder their babies. And they were, they were really getting violent vocally about this thing. And, and you could hear they were angry, and they wanted this decision to be reversed back to the way they wanted it to be, to support abortion. And so we're walking through that group of people, and I can feel myself a little bit, my anger getting built up a little bit, you know, as I'm walking through there. Well, then as we're walking to the next group of people, a block down, no kidding, just a block down, both sides of the street had tables set up as the, uh, I got to look at this because I never remember the letters, the LGBTQ people were out in costumes and all kind of things celebrating their lifestyle. And not only were they celebrating it, people in the community were walking down, oh, this is great, you know, and, and they were buying their goods and helping support their cause. And I felt myself getting a little bit more irritated. But praise God, in the midst of that, I started to pray, and God kind of turned that irritation over to sorrow. And I looked at the spiritual battle. Both of these things, uh, whether it's the abortion or the, the, the lifestyle, the LGBTQ people, it's both things are a direct attack against God's word. And that's that spiritual battle we're in. But what was interesting is in the midst of all of this, as I'm walking through there, we're almost to the bridge. And in the midst of all of this, there was a man on the corner of the street sitting in like a director's chair and he was handing out pamphlets. And I thought, oh, you know, he's, he's handing out more stuff. And I get up to him and he hands me a pamphlet and I take it and it's a gospel track. And I thought to myself, you know, in the midst of evil, there's a man, wasn't standing for Christ, but sitting boldly for Christ, handing out gospel tracts. 
And, you know, as I was looking at all those things, I was reminded the last verse in the book of Judges. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. And that's what they were doing. But this man was doing what was right in God's eyes. He was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Even though they didn't want to hear it, he was getting the message out. I saw some of the gospel tracts were on the sidewalk after people saw what they were, but some people took them and kept them. So we'll pray that in the midst of all of that, in that spiritual battle, this man was sitting strongly there, standing for Christ. So it brings me to the first verse of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. How was he able to do that? How was this man able to go out in the midst of all that and do what God has called him to do, share the gospel? Well, I believe he was going in the strength of the Lord. He wasn't going in his own strength. And here in uh, chapter 6, verse 10, uh, Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul, as he gets into this whole passage of the spiritual armor, he says, listen, be strong in the Lord. I think he started off that way because he didn't want them to be trusting in the armor he was talking to them about. He wanted them still, even though the armor is from the Lord, he still wanted them to focus on, it's not the armor, it's the God who gives it. It's the God who gives us the tools to use. So he says, be strong in the Lord. And in Philippians, uh, Paul tells us that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That song we just sang, uh, the newer one that Walter just, it's the part of it says, let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. And so again, the same thing in the strength of the Lord. How did Paul get to that point? Well, in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we read this. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. It's interesting that he says that twice. See, when we're trusting in the strength of the Lord and we, he uses us to accomplish his, his purposes, we don't exalt ourselves. We realize it's God who does it, God who's doing it. Then he says, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, the storm in the flesh. And he says, he has said to me, listen to this, my grace is sufficient for you. For the power, for power is perfected in weakness. Just like we sang this morning. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Have you ever wondered why it has to be a spiritual battle? Why can't it be easy? You know, go out and share the gospel and, and people say, yes, I want to receive Christ. But it's, it's difficult because we're in a battle, but yet God also uses those difficulties to strengthen us. So how do we serve in Christ's strength? Well, notice in the midst of, of that passage you just read in verse 8, Paul prayed. Paul showed us that prayer is needed if God is going to act. Therefore, we need to pray. And when we are finished praying, we need to pray some more. And before we start off this passage and focusing on being the strength of the Lord, we need to be a people of prayer. If we're going to go out there and fight that battle, we need to be a praying people. I would wager to say that if I went and talked to that man in Greenville, South Carolina, I bet you he prayed much that morning before he went out there. And we need to be praying. You see, when we as God's children pray, we're showing that we realize we need him. If we're not a praying people, we're proud. We think we can go through life without him. Well, we don't need his strength. We can go out and fight this spiritual battle on our own. Have you, this past week, left for work, went out into the world and forgot to pray? I remember one time we were doing an evangelism visit in the stage, going out door to door, and I was, I was a trainer for evangelism, and I was taking a team out to share the gospel. And we get out of the car and said, okay, let's go. We're going to go to that street there. And one of the trainees said to me, the goal of all trainees, talking to the trainer this way, the trainee said to me, we haven't prayed. And oh, it broke my heart because I was going out there in my own strength. Guys, if we're going to fight this spiritual battle, we need to do it in his strength. And if we're going to do it in his strength, we need to do it by the power of prayer. Without prayer, we're going to fall in a spiritual battle. Without prayer and in his strength, that spiritual armor is worthless. We can know the scriptures. We can do all the things. But if we're not doing it in the power of the Lord, 
we're going to fail. And we know we're not doing it in the power of the Lord when we're not praying. So let's take a look here at the armor of God that we've been given. And I see here, every slide's in here twice. So you'll have to bear with me a second. But we're going to take a look at the first armor, which is the belt of truth. So let's look at um, verses 6, 11 to 13. First, he says, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and have done everything to stand firm. Here we see that God does not expect us to go into the battle negative. Rather, he says, he gives us everything we need to fight the battle and to win. Notice he says, put on the full armor of God. He doesn't say you can pick and choose these pieces of armor, these six pieces we're going to look at. He says, you need to put on the full armor of God. Who are we fighting? Well, we're fighting Satan. He is the arch enemy of God. He has been the arch enemy of God since God threw him out of heaven. You want to look at that, you can look at Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28. Uh, Tyron said, I'm on a timer, so I'm not going to go there to those passages. No, I wasn't anyways, I'm just joking. But since Satan, has, his goal is to destroy God and destroy his prized creation, mankind. He started in the Garden of Eden, we know, and he hasn't stopped. But you know, the battle's already won. The cross saw to that. But yet in the midst, while we wait for the final victory, we wait for Satan to be cast into the lake of fire, we're in a battle. What's the battle? The battle is for souls. He desires that we serve him and fight against the evil one while we wait for him to finish the war. And as we see here in the next few verses, God gives us everything we need to do so. Before we go into this first belt of, a belt of truth, I want to ask us a question. As we join here today, can we say that we're involved in the battle? Are we serving him? This message is only for those who are willing to live for Christ. A Christian who is not serving, not sharing the gospel, and not living according to the truth of God's word is not fighting against Satan at all. If that's you today, you're exactly where he wants you to be. And so he's not going to waste his time fighting you in battle because he's already got you on the sidelines. So if you're here today and you're not sharing the gospel, you're not, you may say, what battle, Pastor Jim, are you talking about? Life's great. But maybe it's because you're not in the battle at all. Some of the guys who were in the States in World War II didn't realize how bad the war was because they weren't there. And the same thing with us as believers. If we're not out there in the battle, we don't realize what's taking place. So I want to challenge you this morning. If you're not in the battle, I pray that you listen and you would, by the end of this message, say, listen, I want to be in the battle. I want to live for Jesus Christ. And if you are in the battle, listen to these pieces of armor. Listen to what God's given us. And may he help us to be ready to prepare ourselves to be ready for the battle that he's placed. So the reason six, verse 14, the belt of truth, he says this, stand form, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So in verse 14, we see the first two pieces of armor. And the first one is the belt of truth. In ancient times, a warrior would put this belt around him and it would hold some of his weapons. And he also would be able, usually they wore like a long, I was going to ask Francois to come with the dress on today so we could do this, but I forgot. Usually, and they would take this and they would gird it around so they could take up their garments so they could move freely. They didn't have to trip over their, their long, whatever they called that thing. I should have done more research, but the long skirt-like thing. And they had to have that belt on that. And Paul's are using this. He's, listen, the first thing, you need to be ready to move freely. You need to be ready to walk freely in battle. So therefore, put on the belt of truth. Now, what's the belt of truth? Well, we're going to be looking at the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God in a little bit. And that's the only offensive weapon in this group of uh, weapons that God's given us in his armor. This is not so much us communicating the word of God and preaching the gospel. What this is, the belt of truth, is us living the truth out in our lives. Listen, if we are not living out the truth of God's word, we're losing the battle. 
If you're living the Christian life as a hypocrite, you can't share the gospel to anyone because they're going to say, oh, yeah, you're telling me this? I see what you're doing. And so how can we, you know, if that's what Christianity is, then I don't want any part of it. So we have to be living in truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to be living a Christ-like life. So I believe this belt of truth here is living the life of the scriptures, living what how God's told us to live out into the world. And if we do that, people aren't going to be able to accuse us and make us less effective. You see, Satan wants us to, to be hypocrites. He wants us to do those things because it weakens us for battle. He can't have our soul. God has that. But what Satan's desire is, is to ruin our testimony and to ruin our life for Christ so that we can't be used to see one more person come to know Christ as their Savior. See, this battle that Satan's waging, we're going to talk about this all throughout the message, is the gospel. And if we're not walking in truth, we're not going to be effective in communicating the gospel. People are going to say, who are you to tell me this? You're just as bad as I am. So we have to be careful. We need to be walking in truth. The next one is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, it was interesting. Again, the, the song that Walter picked, I always just marvel at how God orchestrates things, you know, because we don't usually tell anybody what the, I don't anyhow usually tell anybody what songs to pick. And it's neat because this breastplate of righteousness is not talking about us doing righteousness in the world. That's which is covered in walking in truth. What this is talking about is the righteousness we have in Christ. So when we sang that song, washed all my sins away, we need to take hold of that and believe it. Because what Satan wants to do for you and I, especially if we were saved later in life, or if maybe we had a period in our life where if you were like me, there was a period in my life where I walked away from the Lord for about three years. You know what Satan did to me after I came back to the Lord? After you were saying you were doing this and that, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to serve the Lord? Listen, Satan was accusing me and trying to get me to say that I'm not going to serve the Lord because I failed him. I'm sure he was doing the same thing to Peter when Peter denied Christ. But you see, when we're saved, when we're born again, one of my favorite passages of scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I already preach a message without quoting it once. In verse 21, it says, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So the moment that we have trusted Christ as our Savior, not only are all our sins washed away, and that's a beautiful enough picture, not just a picture, but truth, but then we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks at you and me, he doesn't see my sin. He doesn't see even the forgiven sin. He sees the righteousness of his son. So Satan can't accuse us. One of my favorite verses in Romans 8, verse 1. So there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Satan doesn't like that verse, and he still tries to condemn us. But we have to tell him, listen, you can't condemn me. And we don't do it boastfully saying, listen, I'm a super Christian. You say, you can't condemn me because when I was saved, I was clothed with the righteousness of my Savior. And so don't let past sins keep you from the battle. Walk into that battle securely with the belt of truth, living the way God wants you to live so people can't accuse you now. But don't let your past sin, don't let Satan accuse you until you're not ready for battle either. You can go out with the righteousness of Jesus Christ into a lost world, and God wants to use you to see many come to him. Satan will try to condemn us and keep us from serving Christ. But as we just read in Romans 8, 1, in reality, he can't because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The next piece of armor is the gospel of peace. In verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 6, it says this, and having shod your feet, that means kind of covering your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You see, Roman soldiers wore sandals with cleats in them so that they can stand firm. Now, I played American football, and we just didn't wear sneakers. We had cleats. In fact, when I was a freshman year, because I'm so old, we still had metal cleats. They outlawed those later um, when they got smart. But when you got out there, even in the wet 
ground, you could stand firm because they, they dug into the ground and Roman soldiers wore these type of shoes so they could stand firm in battle. Well, what helps you and I stand firm in battle? The gospel of peace. We can go out into the battle because of the gospel. Years ago, when we first started here in South Africa, one of the Zimbabwean men we were training uh, preached a message, put on the gospel shoes, he said. And he referenced this passage. We need to put on the gospel, to go out into the world with the, armed with the gospel. It's going to be the power to change lives. Too often, the church is more preoccupied with entertainment, comfort, or even getting involved in the states. We saw many churches get involved in the political mess with the Roe v. Wade and all those things. I understand where they're coming from. But listen, the Bible never tells us to legislate morality. It tells us to preach the gospel. And so guess what? Roe v. Wade's overturned. It hasn't stopped the evil. Only the gospel is going to stop the evil. And it's going to do it one person at a time. So we need to go out with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, but walking in the power of the gospel. We can stand firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The central focus of spiritual warfare we are in is Satan trying to keep people from Christ, and we're trying to bring them to Christ. And if you're not doing that, you're not in the battle. You may not be facing any spiritual. You see, many times we use this passage of Scripture, and rightfully so to a degree, for our sanctification. We need to put on his armor so that we can be sanctified and more like Christ. Yes, that's a part of it. But the battle really isn't about our sanctification as much as it is about the gospel. And so we need to put that on so we can go out and share Christ with others. Satan is all about getting the churches off the focus of the gospel and on to other things. And we must never allow that happen here at Faith Fellowship. If we're going to be successful in the spiritual war we're in, we must stand firm in the gospel. We can confidently put on our gospel shoes and go out and fight for Christ. Well, let's keep going here. In verse 16, we see the next one, the shield of faith. In ancient times, the shield the soldiers used was large and almost, it almost covered the whole body. It wasn't one of these, look, it was, you know, it probably would cover my whole body because <laughs> I'm as big as the shield probably. But even if you're taller, it covered most of your body. They had a helmet we're going to talk about in a minute, but then the shield would cover their their, their, most of their, their vital organs, like the breastplate of righteousness did as well. And so they were well protected, but the shield was usually had leather on it, and then they usually, before battle, would, would, would soak that leather with water. Why? Because their enemy, a lot of times, would fire arrows, flaming arrows at them. And when the, it struck that wet leather, the flaming arrows wouldn't, wouldn't hurt them. And so they used the shield to protect them. And Paul wanted his readers here to put on the shield of faith. I read a quote this week by Billy Graham. He said, faith simply means believing something is true and then committing our lives to it. That's a good general definition for faith. But we have to be careful. Because faith isn't putting our trust in a talk show host, putting our trust in Oprah or any of those things. Faith is only as good as the object that you place your faith in. If I told you guys, listen, we're going to go out in the spiritual battle, and we're going to go out there and fight, and I said, here, I gave you a big, wet piece of poster paper. I said, here's your shield. It covers your whole body. Go and fight. They're going to say, Pastor Jim, this isn't going to protect me. Stuff's going to go right through it. You see, well, I have faith in that. Well, you're going to say, yeah, your faith may be in that, but this thing is no good. And you know what? I think about that, and too many times we put our faith in the people of the world. We put our faith in the wisdom of the world. We put our faith in talk shows and books and all these things, and we're quicker to put our faith in that and psychologists and the rest before we put our faith in the only one we should put our faith in, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, God and his word. You see, we put on the shield of faith, and it's because it's a strong shield because of who we're putting our faith in. If you're here today and you're trying to fight the spiritual battle by your cultural beliefs or your your schooling or whatever you're you're putting in place of the Bible, that shield's not going to protect you in the spiritual battle. You may go out confident, and then you're going to know, why did I fail? I had faith. Yeah, but your faith was in the wrong thing. 
our faith has to be in the word of God. I used to run to my father a lot for a lot of things. Still might if he were living. But it's usually because my father would take me to the Bible. But what I should have been doing all along is running the scripture and running the Lord in prayer first. Even my father, who's a believer, shouldn't take the place of me putting my faith in the one who saved him. Don't even put your faith in your pastors. Put your faith in the one who saved your pastors, the Lord Jesus Christ. The more you know and of course, I always say this, the more you know God, you can't have faith in God unless you know him. How do you know him? Getting into his word, talking to him in prayer. And oh, by the way, you get to know him better when you're out there in the spiritual battle. Serving God helps you know God more. And if you don't know him, you're not going to put your faith in him. Many of you may be trusting in other things that I talked about earlier because you really don't know the God that saved you. Oh, you're saved. You're born again but yet you haven't spent time getting to know his promises, getting to know his character, his attributes, his word. And so you're reluctant to put your faith in him because you don't know him. A lot of these young kids sitting here, the first time I pulled up to take them to junior church, looked at me and said, I'm not going to get in your car. But as they got to know us at Faith Fellowship, when they saw the combi coming around, they could run to it because they knew us. They knew that we loved them as, as a church, and we knew that we were going to be there for them and teach them and and so as they got to know us, it grew. And guess what? As we get to know God better, we're going to grow. We're going to grow in our faith. And our faith is going to take us into battle. And then we're going to stand strong with that shield because our faith in the God who can protect us, who can deliver us, who can use us, who can strengthen us, we're going to have faith in him. So don't go out in the spiritual battle with self-help books. Use the one self-help book, and that's the Bible. And we need to have faith in the God who wrote it. The Bible was never given to us just to learn it. It was given to us to learn the God who wrote it. And as we know him, we'll wholly, confidently hold that shield of faith, knowing that our God will never take us anywhere we're not supposed to be. He's never going to let us go through anything that's not supposed to happen. Why? Because he works all things to good to those of us who love him. So that shield of faith is important. And you have to make sure that you have faith in the one who gave it to you to be able to use it correctly. It's interesting in this picture here, you see the soldiers. It's interesting, as I was studying this week, there's two different accounts of this. Some say that the soldiers just would go side by side with the shields. But one guy I read said that some of those shields interlocked so that the soldiers could go through battle. All these shields interlocking and there might be 20 guys in a group, but they could go as one. You see, that's the beauty of the church, isn't it? God gives us a shield of faith, but he doesn't expect us to fight the battle by ourselves. We're part of an army. And guess what? We can go out there together as a church and fight. Put our shields of faith together and go out and fight the battle. God's using faith fellowship to plant a church in Pesantrical. I hope soon after that, God's going to use Pesantrical to plant a church somewhere else. And we can go together. We're not lone rangers. My dad didn't go into battle World War II by himself. He went with a group of rangers. And together, they fought the battle. We go, first of all, not alone ever because we have our Lord and Savior with us, the Holy Spirit inside of us. But we also can go together as believers, join our shields together to fight this battle. The next piece of armor is the helmet of salvation. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We're going to look now at the last two pieces of armor. How am I doing, Tyron, for time? Pretty good? First, we see the helmet of salvation. The soldier's, the soldier's helmet protected his head and his brain or mind from that which could hurt him. And it's the, the brain's the central control of our body. It's our computer, and we need to protect it. Without it, we can't do anything. And so this helmet was to help the soldier to be protected from damaging his brain from a blow to the head. And the helmet of salvation here points to God's ultimate victory over sin. Remember I said before, the battle is won. Satan and the, his forces of evil uh, put Jesus on the cross. 
and he died. But his resurrection from the dead provides all of us with victory. And that helmet of salvation can protect us against anything. Remember, they, the Bible says, that why should we worry about those who can destroy the body? Worry more about those him who can destroy the soul. And the helmet of salvation allows us in the, in the battle without fear. We can go in the battle knowing that even if the battle takes me, I'm better off. Paul says to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And matter of fact, Paul fought that battle, didn't he? Sometimes I want to stay and, and fight the battle, but sometimes I want to go home and be with him. And then he says, it's better that the Lord wants me here, I'll stay and fight. And so this helmet of salvation protects us. In Christ, we have the power to face anything. You believe that? If uh, you're in town next week and God leads you to go share the gospel with a guy that's two and a half meters tall with tattoos over him and, and uh, wearing earrings in every possible orifice of his body, are you going to go up and share the gospel to him? God gives you the strength to face anything. Matter of fact, you may find out that that man's more open to the gospel than most. Okay? So God gives us the strength to face anything. Paul said that as I read earlier. In Christ, I can do all things who strengthens me in Philippians 4.13. And as believers, the same is true for us. We need to protect our mind from anything that can tell us differently. Sometimes we go out into the world not believing we've won the battle. We don't believe that Jesus is our strength and our power. And that may even keep us from going out and fighting the battle. Well, I can't share the gospel. I'm not. How can God use me? And I'm shy anyways. And, and huh? don't worry about you. It's not about you anyhow. It's the, the God who's going to use you. So our salvation should give us that strength. The moment we were saved, by the way, we were given the mind of Christ. We shouldn't be thinking that way anymore. We should be thinking like Christ. We see that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But Paul closes that off by saying, but we have the mind of Christ. Why do we have that? Because of salvation. The moment we were saved, we were able to think like Jesus. And if we're thinking like Jesus, we go out into that battle unafraid and ready to serve. You know, there are many things hidden to us as human beings. Naturally, we have a limited perspective. I may have more of a limited perspective than most, most but we have a limited perspective. We can't see the things God sees. But that being said, we have a Savior who knows everything. He has given us the privilege through the Holy Spirit to understand his word and therefore have the same mind as his. And that's because of that helmet of salvation that we have. Listen, we're never going to know everything that Jesus knows. But because of our salvation, we can know everything we need to know as we study his word and allow his Holy Spirit to illuminate it for us. Our salvation made this possible. The natural man cannot understand the things of God, but we who are spiritual can. This knowledge, or as Paul described as the helmet of salvation, equips us for battle in an evil world. The last piece of armor, the sword of the spirit, which is, it, I like how the verse says, because you don't have to find out what it is, it tells you. The word of the spirit, which is the word of God. So far, all the pieces of armor we looked at were defensive. The sword of the spirit or the word of God is the only offensive one. And you know what, guys? A greater spiritual weapon we couldn't think of than the word of God. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, what did he do? Did he say, <laughs> he said, no, it is written. He used the word of God to defend himself. When you're faced in life today making a decision, what do you use? As you're walking in the spiritual battle. Are you using anything but the word of God? You better be using the word of God. It's our weapon. And as we discuss things with people, as we look at what decisions to make, how to live, how to help people come to Christ, we're not going to convince them by any other means than the gospel, the word of God. The word of God is our weapon. It's our sword. It's our offensive weapon to go out and change the world for Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When you and I as believers unashamedly take the word of God into a lost world, it has the power to change it one soul at a time. The problem is, is many times we think, well, I need to talk to them first and convince them before I share God's word because, you know, this is a modern world and, and they're not going to accept the Bible. Can I say this? Baloney. If we're ashamed to use the word of God to win a lost soul to Christ, then we don't have faith in it. Listen, I taught a class at about a, Back in the States at our sending church, I think it was, it was a semester, I forget, maybe 12 weeks, I taught a class on apologetic. It wasn't long after I taught the class on apologetics, I asked myself, why did I teach that? <laughs> because I was telling people how to be clever, how to, to switch arguments and those things. In other words, I was making apologies for the word of God. Yes, we can talk to people I, I, you can use those things for just a minute to give you the opportunity to share the gospel. But we can't be. The gospel who changed your heart and changed my heart will do the same for their heart. We don't have to be. Science says that there's no such thing as creation. It doesn't matter. We don't have to be ashamed of the word of God. We can go out into a lost world and use it because God's word can divide the soul and the spirit because it did ours, didn't it? And it made us alive in Christ. The living word it's a living word because it can give life and it gave you and I life. So when you and I take that into a lost world, God can use us to change it one person at a time. Are we ashamed of his word? Or are we wielding it, wielding it as a sword to win the world for Christ? Listen to this. Every soul won for Christ is a battle won for Christ. Let me say that again. Every soul won for Christ is a battle won for Christ. The spiritual battle isn't that much bigger than the next person God gives us to share the gospel to. The sword of the spirit, the word of God, cuts through Satan's lies and shines the light of truth to eliminate the darkness of evil. It's our weapon to fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Don't be ashamed to use it. And while I say that, study it and know it so that when you do use it, you can use it confidently. It has the power. But you know, sometimes when you're taught battle, you have to be taught how to use the sword too. Philip was a, Pastor Philip was a fencer, weren't you, Pastor Philip? You probably weren't very good the first time you went in there. They probably got you pretty good, didn't they? So we have to, to know how to use the sword, don't we? And, but, but don't be afraid to use it because it's the power that saved you and it's the power that can save others. Well, as we finish up in this passage, we got to plug into the power, and that power is prayer. Look what Paul says here in verse 18 to 20. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. I'm going to stop there just for a minute. He, he gives you this whole, he, first of all, he starts off by saying, you've got to have strength in the Lord. And then he gives you the armor. And then he, then he doesn't say, okay, now go use it, does he? He says, now listen, with all prayer and and petition, that means crying out to God, pray at all times in the spirit. Again, the battle has to be won with prayer. He says here, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Again, praying for the other believers. We need to be praying for one another as we fight the spiritual battle. And pray on my behalf, Paul says, pray for me. And I know your, your pastors, Pastor Cal, Pastor Philip, and myself, Covet your prayers. We need your prayers. As you need our prayers, we're praying for you. Prayer is that power source. You see, plug into the power. I remember as a young man, we were in our church, and, and uh, about halfway through the message, you know, in fact, there's a guy that sat in front of us one row. I won't say his name just in case he goes on YouTube and sees it. But usually about halfway through the message, he was good to be sleeping. So you go over there. In fact, my, my sister and I used to look and say, oh, is he yet? Is he asleep yet? And sure enough, he's over there. But he, he kind of looked like he was reading his Bible, but he was sleeping. And so anyhow, why do I say all this? It's because 
the pastor was preaching on prayer and the power of prayer. And so we had a pulpit like this, and it was open at the bottom. And he reaches down, and he pulls out a skill saw. And he holds it up, and he says, listen, this skill saw right now, I can, he's holding the plug here, and he says, listen, it's not working. It, it doesn't have the power. But he says, when I plug it in, he plugged it in, and he held the skill saw in front of the microphone and turned it on. Let me tell you, that guy said, he woke up like the rapture took place. But I don't want you to walk away with that image. I want you to walk away. The skill saw didn't work without the power. And guys, we go out there without prayer. Not only is it prideful and arrogant, it's stupid. Because we can't do it without his power. This, this armor, we could go out and walk confidently with the armor. But if we're not praying, we're going to be not flat. It's prayer is so important. And then he says, um, he says, pray on my behalf that the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth. So pray for me that God will help me say what he wants me to say. To make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Again, he realized this battle is the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in change. I was telling us from prison. He says that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Guys, we do need to have our prayer chain and pray for jobs and sicknesses and things. I know Terry and I covered at your prayers when she was going through chemotherapy and all those things. I'm not saying that's not important, but we better not stop there. We need to be praying that God will use each of us to share the gospel and to go out there and fight the battle that God's given us to fight. So Paul knew that prayer was the power needed to effectively fight the spiritual war we as believers face. And again, in verse 18, he says, pray at all times. And if we want to be effective warriors for Christ in this spiritual battle, we must first be prayer warriors. Pray must be before the battle, during the battle, and then for thanks to God after victory in battle. We need to be praying before, during, and after. As I said at the beginning, when we're finished praying, we need to get down on our knees and pray some more. I want us to go back to the man handing out the gospel tracts in the midst of evil while we were in South Carolina who I spoke of earlier. Why? Well, the spiritual battle we've been talking about and the armor we need to fight, it, it's not just about our sanctification, spiritual growth, and walking victoriously in Christ, but something even bigger. It's about the gospel. The gospel is our goal in battle. It's our battle cry, and it's our hope. If the gospel is not the reason for fighting the spiritual war we're in, then we've already lost the battle. Satan's not going to attack us if we're preaching the word here and feeding each other. You know, I've been in churches in the States, some of our supporting churches, who they're great at teaching these long expository messages and teaching people the deep things of faith. But that church has the same people in it today as it had 12 years ago when we first went there. Because they're not going out and sharing the gospel. Their church isn't growing. And Satan probably not attacking them so much because he's not worried about them. God already has their soul. Satan says, look, they're not going out and trying to win anybody else's, so I'll let them go. Not that there's anything wrong with learning the deep things of God, but if you just come to church to feed yourself and you're not worried about feeding the lost, there's a problem. So we can't, you and I can't just be concerned about our spiritual walk and our spiritual growth. If we are, we're not being obedient to the commands of Christ to go and share the gospel. This man in South Carolina was obedient and he went out to share the gospel. We don't know, as, as somebody said earlier, Pastor Phillips said, we don't know. That man doesn't know the gospel tracts that he handed out. Maybe one day he'll see people in heaven who he gave those to and God used it to save souls. If the gospel is not the reason for fighting this battle we are in, We've already lost a battle. In the back of the church, I've set out some gospel tracts. I have them English and close and African ones. They're there, there for two reasons. The first is obviously for us as believers, when you leave here today, if you want to be part of the battle, take some of those gospel tracts. And then pray and ask God for strength. Put on the armor of God and go out there and use them. You'll be surprised how God will use you to win souls for Christ. Well, there's another reason 
I set the gospel tracks back there. As for anyone here today who's not sure you're saved, what these gospel tracks will tell you is simply what we find in God's word in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Where Paul writes, I delivered to you as the first importance that I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The first point of the gospel is this. Christ died for your sins. He had to die for your sins because the Bible says we're all sinners. And if you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, as we sang earlier, for us as believers, he's washed all our sins away. But as Walter said, if you haven't trusted in Christ, you're still dirty in your sins. And the wages of sin is death. And that's just not going into nothingness. That's eternal death in the lake of fire, a place called hell, where there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth, pain, torment, darkness, horrific things. But Jesus died in your place, so you don't have to go there. Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. Proved that he died. He was in the tomb three days, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He won victory over sin and death, and he offers that as a free gift to you. So if you're here today and you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, please, right where you're sitting, you can bow down and say, I believe, Jesus, you died for me. I believe you rose again. Please forgive me and be my Lord and Savior. If you do that, in case you're sleeping, the moment you do that, you'll be saved. Now, if you're not sure, you can come and talk to myself or Pastor Philip. We would love to talk with you. But if you're shy, like I probably am in those circumstances, you can also go back and take one of those gospel tracts. Whatever language you need it in, English, Tosa, or Afrikaans, take it, pray before you read it, and say, God, if what Pastor Jim just said is true, help me believe it. And you can go home and read that gospel track. And just like the pastor who trained me in the States years ago, he took a gospel track that was given to him. He opened it up. It was called the Four Spiritual Laws, and he opened it up and came to know Christ as a Savior. So if you're not sure you're not saved and you're too shy to talk to us, take a gospel track with you. Now, if you want to be saved, you don't have to wait to do that, though. Please see us. We would love to give that joy to help you come to know Christ here and now. You don't need us either. You can do it right where you're sitting. The gospel. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, please Come to us, pray where you're sitting, or take a gospel track, and come to know Christ as your Savior. For those of us who have trusted in Christ, we must remember we're in a spiritual battle. Remember I said at the beginning, if you're going through life and not experiencing spiritual warfare, it is most likely because you're not living for Christ and serving Him. It seems like a harsh statement, but it's true. Satan doesn't waste his time on backsliders or ineffective Christians, pew sitters, we used to say. A pastor used to threaten that one day we we're going to come to church and wouldn't be any pews. So he wouldn't just sit in it, he said. Satan does not need to waste his time on inactive Christians. This is because they're exactly where he wants them. I hope that's not you today. But if it is, I hope God's speaking to your heart right now to say, then no more. I'm going to fight for Jesus Christ. If you're living in Christ and are taking part in the spiritual battle God has placed us in, you need to be a person of prayer. You need to trust completely in him, draw on his strength, his power, and put on the whole armor of God that he's given us. As born-again believers, this is our protection, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet prepared with the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, along with the sword of the spirit, or what God has given us to fight against the evil one. We must ask the Lord to help protect our minds, our bodies, and our hearts as he gives us the tools in Scripture to do this. He will help us use everything in our lives, whether we go through good or bad, he will help us to use it for his glory to grow us and to make us fit to serve him. And God can take anything that happens to us, even the bad things, and use them to shape us and make us into the person he desires. When we allow him to do this, we'll be victorious. We will give him glory and will point others to Christ. Are you ready for battle? Are you willing to surrender your life to Christ and commit to going out into a lost world and fight for him? In the scripture passage we read this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, 
he said to Timothy this. And listen, Timothy was in a battle. If you read that passage, there was all kind of stuff going on. And he was in a battle. People even attacked him because of his age. Paul well, had to tell him before. He said, don't let people despise you for your youth. But then he tells him this in verse 12. And he finishes that passage, I think verse 18, with a similar cry. He says this, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. Now, he didn't say receive eternal life because he already had it. He said, take hold of it. What does that mean? That means to take hold of everything we talked about in Christ. Take hold of it. Believe it. Trust it. Let it empower you. And then go out and fight the good fight of faith. You've been saved. You're heirs to the king. You're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You walk in the spirit of, this, with the sword of God. You walk in the spirit of truth. All these things, he says, now go and fight. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I pray that we're making a good confession in the presence of witnesses and God's using us. Well, let's close in prayer uh, as we put this passage of scripture to our hearts. Father God, we praise you. First of all, Lord, if we're here today and we've trusted Jesus Christ as our savior, we want to thank you and express our love and gratitude to you for saving sinners like us. But God, our job's not done. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we're promised a home in heaven. Yes, we have a beautiful relationship with you, but that relationship isn't growing if we're not serving. And Lord, I pray for each of us now, Lord, today, you would help us to be soldiers of Christ. Help us, Lord, to be willing to go out into battle. Help us to go into battle, trusting you. Praying beforehand and praying during and praying after. And then help us to take up this armor that you've given us to go shine bright into a dark, evil world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we need you. And I pray you would help us all leave this place confident as we go into battle that we're willing to serve you. And then, God, you'll show us great and mighty things. Just like all the Old Testament people you sent into battle. You said the battle's not yours but mine. And they saw you do great things. And, Lord, you'll do the same for us. Just help us have faith. Help us to put on our gospel shoes and go out into a lost world and tell it. And then, Father, I pray if there's anyone here today who's never trusted in Christ, that this will be the last day that they doubt you, that they don't know you, and today they will put their faith and trust in you. And Lord, we just pray these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, thank you, Pastor Tim. Stand and we'll sing our final hymn together. Set my heart, oh dear Father, on thee and thee only. Give me the thirst for thy presence, divine. Lord, be my focus, my loving devotion. Urge me from our welcome.
I hope we meant what we sang there, because it's exactly what Pastor Jemus is preaching. And I'm going to go on to notices, because school holidays, sad for the kids, I'm sure, are finishing tomorrow, I believe. But that also means, and that's a wonderful thing, that Tuesday night, the Sunday Club Bible Study will start again at Alex's house at 7 o'clock. Uh, the combined midweek service, Thursday night at 7 o'clock at Lagerberg will start again. Um, continue for principles. And then on Saturday, youth are in for Santa Crawl at 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Okay. Most likely at Alex's house. Most likely at Alex's house, yes, because that is another testament. Lord willing, the construction on the building in for Santa Crawl will start tomorrow morning or very early this week. So that is exciting. And you can please pray for us. It's a new venture for us. I have no building experience whatsoever, and I'm running this project apparently. So that's exciting. But we're very excited about that. And so we can keep praying for that. And then CMI Sunday, next Sunday, we'll start again, five o'clock to seven o'clock. We're studying the book of Genesis and uh, biblical foundations. And so what I wanted to say to add to that is we just learned again this morning the emphasis on the importance of working together to serve the Lord. We saw a picture of shields interlocking. We also saw the importance of God's word. And all of these are opportunities to grow in our knowledge of God's word. All of these are opportunities to together serve the Lord, to together learn, together be equipped to go out and fight that battle. And we are exhalted, and I have to say that I, I was, as, was, as we were singing that, this last hymn, that we are commanded not to forsake the assembling together. Why? Because it's a time of encouraging one another. It's a time of growing together. It's a time that we cannot be lone rangers, but we can learn together, grow together, so that we can effectively go out into the world together or where we are alone and share the gospel. So please, not just Yes, we have to be in church. I pray every Sunday. But we also have to try and make use of every one of these opportunities to grow and learn and come together. So I want to encourage you, please don't miss any of these opportunities. Um, then, young adults, uh, it says here, if you are between 19 and 32 years of age, you are a young adult. <laughs> I'm not one anymore, apparently. Um, but if you are, I want to encourage you, please, it's, it's very cheap, only 250 rand, and if you need help with that, we will help you with that as well. But there's a young adults camp from the 29th, it's a Friday afternoon, until the 31st of uh, July on a Sunday, and there will be, you'll be taken to a church service on the Sunday morning, and the Sunday afternoon, um, it will finish. So I want to encourage all the young adults, this is a great time of, again, fellowshipping with other young believers. Other believers that are your age or struggling or going through the same thing. And if we grow together, we're going to be studying from the book of First John. And that's the one book I'm actually busy studying it myself right now. So I want to encourage all the young adults, if you can, please try and make every effort to be there. It'll be great. I mean, you can speak to myself about that or Pastor Jim, um, and, and we'll help you get there as well. And then the ladies on 9th of August, which is apparently Women's Day, um, there is a women's tea, day tea, a women's day tea at Spartanburg at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, it costs us 80 rand and please, um, for now, you can speak to me, but I'm sure and Sue will get back. Or speak to my wife forever. Just speak to my wife. Please speak to my wife. Give your names to her or to, or to Terry. Don't come to me. Uh, speak to my wife or Terry and, 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 and we'll make sure you have your, but we know who is wanting to go and I'm sure again, um, if the cost is an issue, please speak to us about that. So these are wonderful opportunities to be encouraged, so wonderful opportunities to grow together. Let's make use of them. Um, and I want to encourage you, uh, there is a deadline for the young adults. I think, I'm not sure what the deadline was now to register for the young adults one. 
No, don't know, but please speak to us soon because there is a deadline coming up for that as well. And have a blessed week. It's used up as a gym. Make sure they take those gospel tracks back today. Please take your gospel tracks, yes. Um, thank you, Pastor Jim, for bringing those. Men, have a blessed week using everything God's given us to serve Him together and to be sharing the gospel. Thank you.